Hi, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet today and acknowledge their elders past, present, and future. Uh, today we'll be talking about the role of drug education in school settings, including primary and secondary schools, and how local drug action teams can assist the delivery of the best drug education possible. When we talk about drug education, this term is inclusive of pharmaceuticals, medicines, alcohol, tobacco, illegal drugs, and products that can be inhaled, such as solvents and volatile substances. Drug education is important because young people live in a world in which drug use, including med med medicines and pharmaceuticals, is commonplace. This is a world in which drug use is sanctioned, advertised, and promoted as essential to the good life. And even if the young people don't use them, AOD can affect their lives in a number of ways including through people in their families or peer groups who do use them. So today in our webinar, we'll discuss how schools do drug education, what the key issues are, and we'll consider some resources as well as answer a number of questions that we've received from LDATs. So who are our presenters today? Robin has over 20 years experience as a health teacher before she moved into managing the drug education across Victorian schools, as she now works primarily in New South Wales with rural health services for the Royal Doctors Network. I'm Jeff, is a former secondary school teacher. He's co-edited Drug Education in Schools with Professor Richard Midford and has published on drug prevention policy and practice in numerous journals, as well as producing drug education resources. He is also a bit of a legend of the Alcohol and Drug Foundation. Um, now, we've been asked to cover off on a number of topics by our LDAP teams, and we will see to each of these throughout the presentation. So thank you again for joining us and enjoy. Well, thank you, Laura, um, for that introduction. and. Um, just before we get into uh, the nuts and bolts of drug education, I think we'd like to reiterate your comments, Laura, about uh, drug use uh, being a commonplace part of Australians' lives. And this is partly why um, it is such a complex issue and can be difficult for schools sometimes because it raises a whole lot of issues about people's day-to-day -day behaviour. Uh, we also recognise that drug education is usually a very central part of government drug um, strategies. Um, drug education is a, is a default strategy really because schools are, are, are important socialising agents and our communities expect that schools will provide drug education uh, to inform young people um, because schools obviously help to introduce young people to the society in which they're living and help them prepare them for living in, in that society. So. Um, it's also important, we want to uh, reiterate that um, we, while we can expect schools to do drug education, we should not place unfair or unreal expectations on them because they cannot solve the drug problem we have. That is a whole of society uh, problem and there are lots of agencies involved in dealing with drug problems. Um, however, um, I think we should get straight into it. Um, and I might ask Robin just to introduce us to drug education schools by talking about um, how schools approach it generally. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so generally, um, drug education is part of a comprehensive health education program, and that's important because we don't want students to think that um, teachers are judging them or think that they're all using drugs and therefore there needs to be a specific focus on drugs only. So the other things that we might typically find in a health curriculum might be some work around um, healthy eating, um, safety, relationship building, and young people need these skills throughout their lives. Some of them are generic around problem solving um, and you know, good, developing good social skills, but, but we also need to give them opportunities to develop particular strategies and um, you know, problem solve for specific issues. So that's why it's important that drug education is in there. So we're going to be talking about um, drug education in the school curriculum. Um, but we're also going to be putting that in the context of what we might call a whole school approach or a yes. whole school level school. Yes, so those terms have been used um, because the evidence suggests that curriculum alone is not sufficient to make a difference. It can, but it also needs to be done in the context of a whole school approach where um, the whole school is involved, as the name implies. Whole school is in, you know, involved in um, 
providing a healthy, a healthy and safe environment for young people. So in addition to curriculum, we're looking for a safe and supportive school environment that's supported by good policy and practice, and also something that's um, very relevant to local drug action teams, and that's the attachment to community. Young people need, and schools themselves, need to be connected to families and to the community. And so it's very important that all those elements are present in a young person's life to help build, uh, uh, help promote an environment, reduce the risk factors and build the protective factors for young people. Very good. So uh, we have an, one of the aspects of school drug education that I think is really important is that there's been a lot of research in drug education over the last several decades, both uh, in, in America, in Europe, in Great Britain and Australia. And we're fortunate to have a really good uh, evidence base for drug education. So while it can be a difficult issue for schools to address, um, the good news is that we have uh, sound advice for how schools can best address it. Um, we do have Commonwealth uh, funded development of what are known as the principles for school drug education. And we'd just like to um, share these with, with you right now. Um, Robin, would you like to make any comments about these, about particular principles? I think uh, we've also got the link at the end of the presentation, so please feel free to uh, go to that link and have a look at your leisure. Uh, I think the things that are in there that are very relevant to our discussion today is around the comprehensive whole school approach that involves the local drug action teams and the broader community and how critical that is to young people and families. And also, you know, again, that point around collaboration, evidence-based practice, the risk and protective factors, and people can read more about the evidence that informs those principles that have been critical to schools to guide good practice in schools. I think um, one interesting point about the risk and protective factors that's worth noting is that uh, we know that children who like attending school, uh, who enjoy school, actually have a less risk of uh, smoking tobacco, drinking alcohol and using other drugs. So it just shows how important schools are because um, if schools are welcoming to young people, if young people find meaning at school, then it just means that they have less risk of um, early drug use, which of course is something we want to discuss. I think attachment to um, you know things like sporting clubs in a community is very important too and also the availability of services. So this might be something that the LDACs keep in mind too when they're developing programs. Sure, very good. Okay, so we're moving on. Uh, well, this is a, a link to the principles for school drug education. So these are easily downloadable for people who want some more details and some more background into how those principles were developed and actually what they're about. Okay. Um, one of the questions we have received is uh, what is effective drug education, which is a great question because it does recognise that um, some approaches um, are more effective than others. Um, so Robin, would you like to uh, start us off by addressing these, um, these key issues? Okay, so there's been quite a bit of research that indicates that interactive education is the most effective in developing student agency. So didactic approaches that provide knowledge alone are not effective. Children, students need the opportunity to apply those skills. And so uh, this is something that I think the teacher training elements of a number of programs have focused on, building the, com the competence of teachers to to run interactive activities, including role play. And that's something, again, for LDATs to keep in mind that whatever they're doing in their programs, that there's a, an interactive element so that young people get an opportunity to practice and rehearse skills and also think about strategies and apply some critical thinking. So um, drug education must be age appropriate. There's a, a, a big difference between what you might uh, teach a 12-year-old as compared to a 17-year-old. 
And, um, you know, typically in late primary school, early secondary school, we'd be looking at perhaps medicines, alcohol, tobacco. But the kinds of skills and activities that we would give a young person at 12 before they've had an, um, been exposed to some of these drugs and, um, you know, been given an opportunity to experiment, they, have, they need to have thought about these things and um, had uh, an opportunity to perhaps develop some skills around refusal or making better decisions. And uh, so that's very critical. Um, and yes, just understanding the issues and situations and the pressures and how to deal with them. So perhaps at year 9 and 10, some of the curriculum might contain things about safe parking, whereas in year 12 or 11, it might be around school this week. So you can see that some of the issues, the drugs and the issues, might be um, repeated, and this is a bit to do with the uh, importance of reiterating some of the information, but also the scenarios and the experiences will be different, and therefore some of the skills and strategies that we would give them the opportunity to rehearse would be different. So I think communication, negotiating, decision making, problem solving, problem predicting, they're all very important skills that we need to give students the opportunity to re rehearse. Um, there's been a number of uh, evidence-based drug education programs developed and what the good ones have in common is that they tend to have 10 sessions uh, plus booster sessions. And there's a couple of examples there. Drug education in Victorian schools, for example, um, offers 10 sessions at year 7, 8 and 9. Some teacher training and there are teacher workbooks available as well on the, um, the link that we've provided at the end and some videos. So these are you know, comprehensive drug education curriculums that have some good evidence to go with them and likewise we've provided the link to the climate materials where there are also videos and people can get a look and download those. They're available for them to use. So it sounds as as though you would expect um, all schools to be providing drug education um, at, at some level of the school um, and perhaps running through several years level. Yes, and um, my most recent experience is with Victoria where we mandated 10 hours um, per year, per mm. year level for students and it's, um, I think that's the aim across the state that all uh, schools are expected to provide some drug education and, and there are resources and support for this. Um, so if an adult was interested in working with schools um, on drug issues, then the best advice would be to talk to your local school. Um, and who should they approach to do that if they wanted to make contact with the school? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, the health teacher, the health and peer teacher is probably the person most likely to be teaching drug education in schools, but it may not be the case. So if um, LDATs aren't sure about who to approach, they could approach an assistant principal, they could ask at the office, you know, who is uh, doing drug education in schools, the student welfare coordinator might be a good connection, but it is very important to, to speak to someone in the school about what's happening. And again, you know, on the right hand side of that slide, we mentioned the help promoting the school because there is a role to play, but it's very critical that there is communication with the school about what they're doing and what the LDAP might be able to do to support that work in schools. Okay, very good. So another question um, that uh, we have received uh, several times is about who is best placed to deliver drug education in schools. Um, so we're going to spend a little time talking about this one as well. Um, Robin, would you like to start us off about um, the appropriate people mm -hmm. who, who should be in the classroom and, and who can do the drug education? We've talked about the health teacher because they are trained in health and drug education, so they're well placed to be able to deliver the curriculum in the context of a broader health curriculum. And I talked earlier about the skills that young people need. Um, and, and the teacher is able to draw on other examples in the classroom. They know the students best, they know the learning expectations and the assessment criteria, but they also know the young person. And so they may be able to pick up if there are any particular issues and to either follow up with the student 
uh, refer the student to the student welfare coordinator if they need extra support or talk to families when necessary. But they're also available in the school if the student has any follow-up questions or any issues that they would like to see the teacher one-to-one -one about. As I've said earlier, it's most likely the health and physical education teacher, but it may not be. Um, but they, they are the people with the training around um, delivering drug education. They're the ones that have targeted the training. Um, and I've mentioned the support from the Student Welfare Coordinator who's part of that comprehensive approach to supporting children. And you would hope that there's a good welfare and discipline policy in the school that helps support uh, or underpin the delivery of drug education and the broader programs and policies in the school. Um, and we, we recommend limited use of external experts based on that uh, evidence that the teacher is best placed. There may be the need for an external expert. A teacher may feel a community health nurse or a local service provider would be useful. Um, but just remember that one-off visits by an outside expert aren't particularly helpful. It needs to be in the context of the program and therefore there needs to be a lot of preparation about how that expert will be used, what that expert will be expected to deliver, mm. and then perhaps a debrief about how that went and how uh, any follow-up uh, support could be provided. So clearly the external expert should not be a substitute for a comprehensive program. No, that's for sure, because the teacher knows the student the best and it's about incorporating the services and uh, additional supports where they add value. The other question we've had in, in this regard is about um, people with lived experience of drug dependence. Um, in the past, uh, some schools have um, invited in people who have had experience of drug dependence or drug addiction to talk to students and this has been on the basis that people have believed that person with drug dependence has been there and that uh, the students will listen to them more than they'll listen to a teacher and that that person will be able to sort of tell their story which um, in some ways may be quite sordid uh, and that would put young people off using drugs. Um, unfortunately we know that that is not the case um, and that uh, no reputable um, drug education um, organisation or body recommends that drug dependent people um, should be invited to the school. Um, clearly people with that experience have a, a logical place in drug treatment where their experience and their role modelling um, can apply very well to people who are recovering from a drug problem. Um, that's where they are particularly relevant um, but as you've said Robin Drug education is about relationship development, it's about skill development, and that can't be done by someone visiting the school um, on a one-off basis, or who's going to be simply telling um, their particular story. Mm. Um, the, uh, we do have a, a, a paper on our website that people can download, which, which talks about this in more detail, but essentially, um, the idea of people with experience turning young people off drugs ignores the motivation for drug use. We know that we mentioned earlier that drug use is part of our society um, and that people who get into trouble with drugs um, understand that drug use is a risk, but they, um, their drug problem really derives from the fact that they're dealing with difficult issues, emotional issues. Um, and, drug, and drug use at that level is used to really cope with, to try to cope with that problem. Um, so if, the other problems are that using ex-drug dependent people can glamorise drug taking. Um, we should note that um, the idea of scaring people off behaviour um, doesn't last very long. The scared straight messages wear off pretty quickly. Otherwise nobody would drive a motor car fast on the roads. Um, and some young people are attracted to risk taking, so um, having people talk about uh, how risky drug use could actually be a perverse incitement for some young people. So um, it's pretty clear that um, drug education really belongs to the teachers who know the students uh, well 
And so we uh, trust that people with lived experience will, um, you know, will support people who are coming off drugs, but won't be uh, employed in the classroom. Okay, um, we, we've also been asked for lots of do's and don'ts, and so we're probably going to some degree to be repeating ourselves, but um, just to clarify um, the do's of drug education, Robin. I think the first point's really important around the accurate and all sensational information. We haven't really touched on that. I think we have a tendency in society to problemise um, young people and also that often when we look at statistics around drug use we can inadvertently uh, make young people think that everybody's using drugs and therefore there's something wrong with them if they don't. So it's very important, we've talked about all those other skills like problem solving skills, but knowledge, accurate knowledge is important to provide for young people. And what we've done in the Drug Education Victorian Schools Project and the Get Ready resources that came out of that is to actually turn it on its head a bit and talk about those who have never used rather than those that have ever used it because um, it, it does, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger statistic and it does make people realise that they don't have to use drugs to be normal. And so that's very uh, important. And um, again, we talked about the development of critical thinking skills, uh, how do we respond to situations appropriately, uh, rehearse uh, you know, those kind of skills, the problem solving skills, the, you know, the build social connections and social skills in young people, the group work and the role play are two examples of interactive strategies that are critical to the classroom and to young people's learning and to underpin all those other um, skills that we're trying to develop. Okay, and we also have some things to avoid, so just to reiterate that, um, drug education that is just focused on providing young people with information uh, is not effective. Uh, we also, as you've implied, we shouldn't be assuming that students will use drugs. Um, that can be uh, an incitement for, for, for young people to think that drug use is normal. Um, we shouldn't be demonstrating drug use in the classroom, so um, and that includes you know showing films of people injecting drugs or smoking ice pipes. Uh, we don't want to desensitise um, young people um, to, to that form of drug use, particularly at a very early age. And we've also been asked about beer goggles. Now these are goggles that um, uh, when they're worn, they uh, disorientate um, the person wearing them so that they uh, they're less they become less coordinated or they the, their vision appears to be fuzzy. And this is sometimes uh, being seen as a way of warning young people about the risk of, be, of being intoxicated. But of course, what we find is that young people think this is a funny experience. They actually enjoy being disorientated and even uh, falling over or watching other people fall over. So that's another form of demonstrating drug use that I think we should uh, shy away from. Also, um, we shouldn't be making jokes about drug use um, to young people um, or um, because that's again is going to encourage, perhaps encourage young people to, to see it as, as a normal experience or something that's fun. Um, nor should we talk about our own experience, even if young people might ask us about our, our drug use experience. That's really not part of, of, of their education, and we should reflect that and say we're not here to talk about ex um, our own experiences. And again, we shouldn't um, have students talking about their own experiences or what they say is their own experience because uh, it might normalise drug use and uh, put pressure on students who, who are not exposed to drugs and of course these stories may not be accurate as well. So we should make those rules up front in, in drug education mm. and talk to young people that we're not going to talk about experience, we are going to talk about how we respond to particular situations, how we might respond to particular situations. I think that's useful for local drug action teams too, Jeff, if they're running events with young people to make sure they have some um, you know, agreed rules up front that, that protect people mm. and, um, you know, it's just very good practice, I think, to do that. Okay, uh, we're going to move on. 
Um, and we do have um, some, some links to good drug education resources for schools. Um, this was again, was a, a common question we received beforehand. Um, what are good resources? So we've, we've got the principles of school drug education here. Um, and Robin, you've already talked about drug education at Victorian schools. Would you like to make a comment about this? I think it's just important for people to know they're there, they're free to download, there's good information about comprehensive curriculum and what it should involve and I think we've probably covered that well enough to know that these are evidence-based resources that, that are sanctioned by various government departments, the education departments across the, the country and, and worth having a look at. Okay, so and that's got videos of yes, materials, yes, examples of activities for the classroom. Okay, and similarly, we've got um, resources from other states as well. Yes, that's right. And again, they have been, uh, they draw on evidence and there's some really good practice there. Um, the Positive Choices website is a really uh, good uh, Commonwealth Government website that um, <coughs> has a range of resources for people to have a look at and download. Okay, so we've got the Sedira resources from West Australia, that's the School Drug Education and Road Aware. Mm -hmm. um, we've got uh, the Climate Schools Program from the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre in, in New South Wales. Um, people can have a look at the, the Climate School website, which uh, is focused on alcohol and cannabis and ecstasy education for middle, middle, school, secondary school, middle school students. And also the Crossroads resource, um, and this is quite a different one because this is for senior students, right? That's right, and that uh, deals with schools, but again, reinforces the, um, it, it also deals with perhaps um, <coughs> dealing with violence or, or those kind of issues when alcohol's involved. So some of the more relevant uh, issues that might confront a more senior student. So there's a lot of good resources here that people can download if they want to get a, a good view of what schools actually do in drug education, the sorts of activities that students are involved in and uh, the sorts of materials that they, they use. Um, we've had questions about peer education too, um, and this is a really common issue because um, community groups and local drug action teams and community drug action teams are often involved in or seek to be involved in peer education. So um, let's have a, a look at um, what we can say about good practice regarding peer education. I've had a look at some of the uh, local drug action team applications and some of them involve uh, peer support, peer education, peer mentoring, age to age, age peer mentoring but also intergenerational where older people are mentoring younger people. I think it is useful though, there are a number of uh, key uh, points that we can make about all of those that are good practice. So the program must be age and culturally appropriate. So I mentioned earlier that what you might do with a 12 year old, a year seven year old is of course uh, different to someone who's 17. So that you can't take a group of young people out of school with mixed ages and expect to deliver the same content. And again, if you have uh, young people from different cultures, it's mm. been shown to be more effective if you do culturally appropriate drug education. And it may be looking at different values or different behaviours in, in different cultures. So that's important to uh, take note of. Um, it's always useful to involve young people in the planning. It's, you know, um, it engages them, uh, they have good ideas and um, they can get a sense that they can be change agents in this process. And of course, after they implement, you know, whatever it is that they're doing as part of the peer education program, for example, they need an opportunity to come back, almost like the booster sessions where they come back and have a chance to debrief about what went well, what further skills and information they need to, to do the job well and they need that as an ongoing, uh, ongoing work. Um, they need to be supported by school-based personnel. If there's a peer education program that's being run by a local drug, drug action team out of the school, 
we've already said that this needs to be done in the context of what's happening in school. But further, often the projects or the work that the young people are doing involves going back into the school to do something. So if a school's not involved, they're not aware and they can't facilitate that for the young person. And, and more importantly, they probably, you know, it gives a traction in the school. It's more likely to be successful and sustained. But it's also a way of supporting students in the work that they're doing and linking them in to supports and services if they need them. Okay, so here education is a bit more complex than, than is often assumed, isn't it? Oh, it definitely is. And again, you know, another support that's critical to have on board is the parent involvement. So let, don't overlook parents. Let parents know that this is happening and how they might be able to reinforce the messages or support the young people uh, in the program that they're involved in. It's very important when a local drug action teams um, want to do drug uh, peer support that they have very clear goals. What is it the young person is going to do once they um, train them? Because so often there's this request to do peer education or mentoring. But what is the goal of that? What is the young person going to be meaningfully engaged in? And if it's a range of things, back in a school or in another setting that involves, um, you know, safe partying or whatever messages, again, that's got to be evidence-based because, you know, we have to we do no harm and, and what we want to do with young people needs to be effective. And so there's, it's very important that there's clear goals and that it's effective practice. And training is important not only for the peer educators, but for example, in a mentoring program, the mentees, what do you expect? Um, you know, what are the ethics that need to be uh, observed so you don't do any harm? What knowledge and skills does everyone need to make this program effective? Okay, and we and the links we've got um, also refer to peer education, peer support programs in schools. Yes, there's a couple of examples. Uh, Jeff, I think that we included that people could have a look at yeah. um, if they want to read more about what's working. Very good. So we do have a couple of examples taken from um, the drug education resources that we've already referred to. Um, so these are examples of what schools have done. They've been written up um, as examples of good practice. And so, as you say, Robert, people can look at those at their leisure. Um, and one there that's empowering girls uh, in, in particular. So we hope that people will, will check those out um, mm -hmm. if they're interested in um, doing work with um, young people on peer engagement. And speaking of engagement, um, the other group of people who um, are often a, um, a target, I suppose, of community work is parents. And we've talked already that you know, drug use is part of our, our community. Of course, parents are often drinking alcohol. Some of them may be smoking, taking pharmaceuticals, so they're providing role models for young people. Um, and because parents are very, very important socialisers, as are schools, we would like parents and schools to be providing the same sorts of messages. So would you like to um, talk to us about um, the best way of engaging with parents mm. and, and why, we, why we need to do that? Well, I think we've already mentioned that um, you know the the network of schools, family, community is critical, and that parents are well placed. Um, they have responsibility for young people um, to provide knowledge, and they are very influential in terms of attitudes and behaviour. So it's important that parents feel confident and skilled and have strategies at their fingertips. And I think that's a role that local drug action teams can really play, is um, helping, facilitating parents um, in these areas of um, you know, talking to their children or building strategies for parents to cope and manage um, these situations. Um, and I think it's important to note that we don't want one-off events, but there are some really good programs out there that I know local drug action teams are looking for funding to support parents mm. um, to, to, to do. And I think that's a really good 
uh, way to go because parents are such an important resource in all of this. There is a link to some Victorian uh, parenting resources there in a number of language, languages, which is useful around engaging and working with parents. I know there's lots of other things, but we've just put that one there as, as, as one, was one link that people can go to and again download some free resources should they need them. And of course, the most important one is the, um, the other talk resources on which we have some information on the next slides. And, uh, oh no, sorry, the positive choices. Um, uh, that's again got some parenting uh, resources there. Yeah, um, the positive choices is a website we've talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but ter terrific resources, uh, both for schools and, and for parents, and advice there how to talk to teenagers about alcohol, which is a ticklish issue for lots of parents. So there's great resources there. And the other talk. Yes, which you, you're well placed to talk about. So this is um, an ADF. Alcohol and Drug Foundation program um, where we uh, run forums for parents called the other talk and uh, it's often schools that um, invite us to run forums for parents which really again helps parents. We're aiming to give parents confidence to talk to their young children and um, teenagers about alcohol and other drug issues. Parents often do feel quite diffident about this, though they're used to having this sex talk with young people. They've been well trained over decades, but the alcohol and drug talk um, is a bit more difficult for many parents. So we do provide ideas um, and examples for how parents can do that, and we provide scenarios for, for that discussion. I might just, before we move on, I might just ask you, Robin, about the other, the really, the really common parent program that LDAPs are often. Um, utilising is communities of care, oh, yes. which is the resilient um, school and community framework. Would you like to talk about communities of care for a moment? I think um, that's important uh, in terms of evaluation too, but it is a program that has the support of Deakin University. Um, there are there are a number of steps and good, it's a good process. So I think um, it's an evidence-based model. Um, it, it has, um, it works with liquor outlets. It works, you know, builds champions in the community. Um, it, it has uh, a number of tools uh, to help communities identify the particular issues of concern and address those. Okay, so it works with the community and parents and yes, schools. So it, it brings does. them all together. Yeah, it does. Okay. So I did jump the gun a little bit, but let's talk about um, how LDATs uh, and community groups might evaluate um, their work if, when they're working with schools or when they're working in the community. So yeah. uh, evaluation is always a difficult issue. We, often we think about it at the last minute, so it's good to build it in at the start. But Robin, tell us about your view of evaluation. That's right. I think that's an important point, Jeff, that you need to build into the start. It shouldn't be an afterthought. I think people get a bit primed about evaluation and think it's an exact science and research maybe, but evaluation is important and everything we do should have some form of evaluation so that we know that it's um, having some benefit mm. um, and certainly doing no harm. So it's very important in deciding how you're going to evaluate to think about the questions you need the answers to. So do you want to know about program implementation. How did we go when we implemented that program? Um, you know, did we achieve the goals of the program? Um, or do we want to know the impact on the participants? Um, so for example, if you if your goal is to engage parents in a forum to hear about their issues, you may not need to survey them. It might be that, you know, a hundred parents turned up to a forum and we engage in activities. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the type of evaluation is dependent on the goals of the evaluation. So, and who is the audience for the information? Is it about um, giving back to community some information about the community and drug use, or is it about looking at whether the program is effective in informing the next iteration or the next activity that the LDAC's involved in? And what kinds of information will help you make the decisions you need to make and or to enlighten the audience? 
and think creatively. I know people use surveys a lot and they have a point there about surveys, but you know, sometimes it's case studies or interviews mm. which young people can conduct. Mm. Um, photographs, you know, that, that show parents and young people having fun together. Yeah. And and that tells a very positive story. In fact, the ODAP program does have a lot of um, advice around evaluation um, yes, and ways, it does. creative ways they can collect it. So yes. we should perhaps refer to the ODAP website there yes. where people are going to gain a lot of uh, examples of how they might collect information that shows how their program actually is rolled out. That's right. That could just be, you know, reflection pieces or observations or focus groups, those kind of things. But people do tend to um, think survey. Um, and I'll jump to that point more, Robert, that surveys need to be well designed and executed. Um, there's often universities, local universities, that have perhaps a master's student who's looking for a project mm -hmm. or someone that you can ask for advice. Five well-chosen questions is probably more effective than 20 that are not asking the right things and you're getting information that is not relevant to the questions you need the answers mm -hmm. to. Um, and while it might be important to know that the uh, catering was good and the toilets were clean, it, it's really not central to what you need to know and you risk over-surveying people yeah. and annoying people. Um, so, you know, just a few well-chosen questions and if you can get some expertise to help with that, that's great. Um, I think, you know, it's just worth thinking about the, um, how the information is going to be collected um, and what resources are available to collect that information because it's no use planning for a, um, you know, randomised control trial when that's just not possible within the resources. As much as we want to do um, as good evaluations we can, the resources have to be realistic. So we want to spend that money wisely, but we do want to know the answer to the questions that will inform future work. And that's a good reason to plan it at the start, so you know, because you know exactly what resources you've got that's to right. collect. You've got to shape the evaluation that's right. to the resources. Moving on, uh, we hope uh, that this uh, discussion has been of use to local drug action teams and community drug action teams and anyone else who's um, been uh, taking part in it. Um, the uh, ADF website has got a lot of material. Obviously for LDAPs, there's the LDAP page, um, and there's the Health on Drug Foundation website that's got a lot of drug information, a lot of advice for drug prevention and drug education. And we hope that we hope that people will be utilising that as uh, following this webinar. And I think the takeaway message is that working with schools is critical to make sure that whatever the local drug action team is doing fits into what exists and complements that rather than uh, repeats that. Thank you, Robin.